What's up, everybody? My name is Indy, and that gentleman next to me is Mr. Jay Powell from the Powell Group, from Powell Group Consulting, and welcome to Friday's Indie Game Business. Yay! We've got CL Yehodet, and we are talking about, well, the title is Why Having a Strong User Experience Strategy is Important for Your Game, and the first thing I want to say is my user experience down here in Florida, it is hot and muggy. It's like 74 degrees right now. I feel so bad for you guys where you got all that snow. That that's your own fault. You, that's not like Game UX where you have no control over it because you just bought the game. You literally decided to move to Florida, so you right. don't get to complain about that one anymore. <laughs> I'm so not you're, complaining. My dude, it's <laughs> welcome to the show. Thank um, you. So we always like to start same question. Tell us how you initially got into the industry, and then walk us through your career up to this point. Sure. Okay. So uh, my background is in psychology. I have a PhD in psychology. I'm specialized in cognitive development. So it's uh, the uh, mental processes when you do things like how the brain works, um, perception, attention, memory, that sort of things. And I grew up playing games, including video games with my uh, with my parents, mostly like we're a big gamer family. And uh, after I got my PhD, I I left academia and I wanted to work like directly in games. So I started to work in educational games. Actually, I worked at VTech. So it was um, a toy manufacturer, toy and game manufacturer for, uh, for kids with some educational content. And very quickly, I thought, hey, well, I mean, I could work in the video game industry. I, I love games and, and it's really interesting. It's booming. And I, I was writing a bunch of articles to explain to parents that no games are not the devil because back in 2004, 2005, it was already some uh, discourse that we were hearing in the public. So I was writing some articles to explain, you know, that there are some limitations, but otherwise games, video games are super interesting for child development, like other games, because play is very, very important for uh, the development of your brain, but also to maintain, uh, to stay sharp. It's also important to play and games are part of that. And so at that point, Ubisoft was also looking at for some people in neuroscience or kind of science to help them with, with their games. And this is how I got into the game industry. So I started at Ubisoft in France. I'm French. And so I started in uh, Ubisoft HQ uh, right next to Paris. And then I moved to uh, Ubisoft Montreal. I worked with a playtest lab um, at that point. I worked on, I helped a lot of people because I was um, doing some uh, educational aspect of, of uh, not UX. So UX was not really a term that we we're using back then. But uh, I was talking about how the brain works, how it learns, and what does that mean for games in terms of tutorials, onboarding, but also, you know, how we can make sure like people are going to have fun. And so I was doing some um, training sessions within Ubisoft. So I worked with a lot of people who were working on Assassin's Creed or Watch Dogs and a bunch of games like that. And I worked more specifically on the Rainbow Six franchise. Then I moved to LucasArts in San Francisco, working on a, a bunch of Star Wars games that never saw the light of day because <laughs> Disney bought Lucas and closed down LucasArts. So I stayed less than two years there. That was really intense two years and really fun. I really enjoyed my time then. Uh, but yeah, I worked on, on some um, um, Battlefront games and uh, Star Wars 1313 that maybe you've heard of, but it did not <laughs> come out. And this is when I moved to Epic Games in North Carolina. And I became the director of user experience there uh, at the studio level. So I worked on, you know, I, I initiated the UX initiative and um, uh, started the UX strategy for the studio. And I worked on different projects. I worked on Unreal Engine 4. I worked on uh, several games and, of course, Fortnite. I worked very closely with the Fortnite team uh, up until Fortnite got released in 2017. Uh, and then I left Epic um, in October 2017. And ever since then, I've been uh, working uh, independently as a freelancer. So I'm a game UX strategist, and I work a lot with uh, different studios, um, AAA studios, 
um, um, medium sized studios and also indie uh, developers to help them with their UX strategy and also training people about what UX is really about because a lot of people still think that UX is just about the UI and we can do that later uh, down the line, but it's not. It's uh, really a mindset and how you think about the process of your game and you really uh, think about the strategy to develop your game. It's really, if you do that well and early on, it's going to save you a lot of time and uh, help you find solutions to your problems and identify your problems very early enough so that your game is going to be more fun uh, and more usable and, and more engaging and also more accessible. Um, so that you can have uh, more people playing it and in the end have more revenue so that you can make more games. So that's what I do. So that's a wonderful place to start, actually. So go through from the basic level, what is game UX yeah. and then how that differs from, from UI? Sure. Okay, so user experience is a fairly recent term um, that is the, the idea, it's a mindset, a philosophy, a way to approach development of a product. Um, another term that was used in the past is uh, human factors psychology or human factors engineering. It's about when you develop a product, whatever the product is, you um, you are human centered. So you think about the persons, the people actually, because uh, you want to be inclusive um, with all the people who are going to use your product. And to shift from your own perspective when you develop something to adopt the perspective of the final users so that you can, with your product, help them solve their problems uh, and so that they're satisfied and they can use the product and everything, all, everybody's happy. When we talk about games, uh, it's a bit different uh, because a game is not a tool. It's not a tool to accomplish something like Discord is a tool or um, anything that we use, um, like Unreal Engine is a tool. Um, a game is not a tool. So we don't play a game in order to accomplish certain goals. We play a game to have fun. And games are an art form. So there's another dimension to user experience when we tackle games. So we're not only looking at user uh, at usability, making sure that People who play the game can understand how to play and you know how to do the things they need to do, like craft if there's crafting in the game. Uh, it's also about is it engaging and is it fun. So it's a little bit more complex, but we still have um, tools and and some framework to guide game developers to accomplish that. And so this is what we do. And UI is a part of the, the user experience, but user experience is everything that the player is going to experience with your game. And so. It's going to be the UI, sure, the icons and all this stuff. The HUD is part of the experience, but it's everything else. It's the music, it's the sound effect, it's the design, it's the uh, narrative design, it's the animation, it's like anything. But it's also outside the game. It's like, how do you hear about the game? It's uh, how do you download the game? And how is the onboarding? You know, how do you create an account, for example? Or if you have a problem, how do you contact the customer service? It's also about community management, all of that is part of the experience of the players so it's it's everything so everybody yeah, should be concerned it, it, it <laughs> all of so i'm going to assume that that like myself and other folks who have been doing this for you know 20 some years you do still enjoy playing games but sometimes it's hard for us to separate yeah. work from play and so <laughs> What are some of the things that, you know, especially like on the indie game side, what are some of the things that when you're sitting down and you're playing a game, you just like makes your skin crawl with the mistakes that you know are made on the UX side of the game? What, what do yeah. you see most commonly? Um, the most common mistakes is, uh, there are a few of them. Um, one of the things that I work a lot on is the onboarding of the game. Um, a lot of times, when I work on a game, um, the game developers think about the mechanics, the main gameplay loop, and all the systems, and that's great. But then they don't think about how they're going to onboard the players to, you know, uh, uh, master all these things so that they can have fun with the game. And they have a tendency to think about it late in the process. Um, this is not what we did on Fortnite, for example. Uh, we thought about it very early on, and we did what we, what I call an onboarding plan. So we thought about all the things players needed to learn in order to have fun in Fortnite that were related to uh, the main 
uh, pillars like uh, crafting, uh, harvesting, building, shoot, um, combat. And, and then we try to think about, okay, when do we need to introduce what? especially for Save the World, which is like the RPG part of the game. Um, depending on the mode of your game, we're going to use different strategies to onboard players, but we do want to have a strategy and we need to think about it very early on because if we don't, uh, we end up you know, having like tutorial text everywhere and we've paused the game and introduced things to players that are too fast, too many things at the same time. And this is a thing that I see a lot. Uh, so that's one of the main mistakes, not you know, carefully think about the onboarding of the game early enough. And the second thing that I see often is that um, the game developers don't really think about the re-onboarding players. Because like they sometimes they do think about the tutorials and introduce things, you know, step by step to the players so that they can have time to uh, they're not overwhelmed by everything that the time really to um, compute <laughs> everything. Uh, but then, you know, what's this done is like, yay, they're onboarded. Our job is done here. But then the players are going to stop playing at some point because a new game just came out and they're going to play that new game for a few weeks. And maybe they're going to come back to your game after a few weeks and they would have forgotten a bunch of things and now they're like how does that game is played again and now they don't have any help um so that i see a lot of time as well and so in your opinion aside from fortnite what games have you played recently that you're just like okay they nailed it they did a really good job on this and this is something that we should you know encourage down the line yeah um it's a hard question to answer because I don't think any game really nailed it, like not even Fortnite, because it's, it's very complex. Uh, but now what you want to do is to nail it enough that the frustrations or the things that you don't get are not really um, impeding your your you having fun in the game or how you, to understand the game. Uh, but we have some examples, um, you know, so a bunch of things that we did in Fortnite uh, work well, um, a bunch of things that recent games have done, uh, you know, like God of War recently when I was looking at the, what, what they were doing, um, uh, Overwatch or uh, um, mobile games also work a lot on their onboarding because they... They have it's it's much uh, it's much more difficult for a mobile game that is free to play to <laughs> onboard players um, because players can you know, there's so many other games that they can play so you don't have a lot of time to convince um, and if you have too many frustrations that players are just gonna quit um, so mobile games are really interesting to look into in terms of you know what good practices in terms of UX and a game that I use a lot um, recently more recently is Brawl Stars. Um, they do a lot of interesting things uh, to onboard players, even if it's a multiplayer game. So that's the worst, you know, multiplayer game um, that is free to play and on mobile. That is really, you have a lot of constraints depending on your game. That's really the epitome of constraints <laughs> in terms of game de development. And they do a, a, a very good job at, at onboarding players and introducing things um, little by little and gating the multiplayer until the, the, the players are more into it. Um, but then, you know, it's, it's, it's you know, it's, it's still, oops, there's still a lot of um, other games when, when you uh, work on a a uh, multiplayer game that is more hardcore with a lot of Twitch skills, it's also difficult uh, to introduce a bunch of things. Or games like MOBAs, like they are really, really hard to onboard players because it's very complex. There's a lot of systems to onboard. Um, so these are a few examples. I, I do a lot of uh, training sessions where I give a bunch of examples from different games to talk about different, different things. Uh, there's no perfect game, no perfect onboarding that does not exist. Um, and depending on your game, depending on the mode of your game, depending if it's solo or multiplayer, depending on the business model, it, you have different constraints and you're not going to have the same solutions or um, uh the same ways of, of finding solution for that. Uh, there's no one recipe, and that's what makes it difficult, but it's also what's making it interesting. Um, and again, it's a knowledge form. And so depending on your type of game, depending on your pillars, depending on your, what you're trying to accomplish, um, we use ingredients. Um, and so that's what I do. I, I explain to the game developers what are the ingredients and how we can tackle these things and how to um, how to search for the right problems to solve. Um, so that's we never just 
take the example of one game and then we apply all, all the solutions from that game to the other games. It's really, uh, it depends. Like I, I've yeah, heard it, that this it, is the, yeah. <laughs> the answer that everybody say. It's, it's, it's one of those things that I hadn't really thought about it yep. until you just said that. But yeah, the mobile games are much harder because it's like most of the time you buy a PC game, you download it, you've already invested not only time, yep. but probably a decent amount of, I mean, money and then a decent amount of time just downloading it. You're not going yep. to just go, all right, exactly. I'm done with this. But on mobile games, all the time, I mean, I've had, I don't know how many games that I've downloaded or, you know, been sent as demos and 45 seconds into it, I'm already like, okay, this is enough. Let's yep. go on to something more important. I mean, are there, are there key misconceptions that you see that developers have about UX and, and implementation? Uh, yeah, so the key misconceptions is that we can do that later. Uh, <laughs> um, we can't because, again, UX is a, a way to approach the, the process. Um, another misconception is that UX is going to impede the creativity of the team. So that's another misconception because UX is about helping the team accomplish their creative goals. Um, so that's why there's no one solution that fits all. We have a lot of discussions about what your game is about, what are your, your pillars, um, what is the audience that you're targeting, because we're not going to uh, have the same methodologies and we're not going to find the same solutions depending on all these things. So we spend a lot of time defining where do you want to put the challenge um, in the game. I, I'm going to give you an example. Um, in Fortnite, we we put the challenge in into your tactical decisions on you know what sort of weapons you it's interesting for you to craft uh, depending on your objectives. So this is where we want to challenge players. Uh, we don't want to challenge players into remembering the recipe to craft that weapon. And so we're gonna develop some solutions for players so that they can pin the things that they want to craft on their HUD so that they don't have to remember that because we know that this is uh, some memory load, some cognitive load that is not part of the challenge in Fortnite. So that's really at the very beginning of the UX strategy, we define where we want to challenge players and where we don't want to challenge them. And this is what's gonna define uh, the solutions are gonna put in place and the features that we need um, to, um, uh, release the physical load and the cognitive load for players so that they can focus on the things that are interesting for the game. So that's an example of, of the things we do. And if you think about UX, that it's something that you do later and it's just something about the UI and it's costly, yes, it's, yes, it's gonna cost you time and some money to think about these things early on. But if you do that, you're gonna save time and much more time because if you think about that too late uh you're gonna have to find solutions that are way way more costly than if you think about all that early on in the process so it's an investment that is actually going to save you time and money um but a lot of game developers only think about yeah this investment is too much right now we don't care and they don't see about the cost of not doing it so that's the some of the main uh, uh myths about ux so there's two phrases that we that we hear or two terms usability and engageability yeah explain what those are and the mm -hmm. difference between them you know when it comes to games okay um so usability is a um one of the things that we care about a lot in ux for any product uh we care about it to be usable so we want to make sure that uh, the ease of use and uh, is good. That is, uh, it's going to be efficient uh, for uh, for users. So it's about making sure, like for example, is it easy to do uh, to accomplish something with a product? Uh, do you understand how to do that? Is it satisfying? Is it solving your problem? Um, so usability is is a notion that is very. Uh, research has been there for decades, so it's very established. And we had a lot of what we call usability heuristics, so guidelines, let's say, is a sort of guidelines um, to help um, all the platform developers to make it more usable for their audience. So we care about that also for games. It's about do people understand the rules of the game, what they need to do, what is the what are the objectives, uh, how do they do the things they need to do, like how do you build in Fortnite, how do you craft, how do you you know do all these things. Um, so that's the usability part of it. But also, like I was saying, 
do you have to remember things like do you have to remember the recipe um so that's increasing the workload for players and that's part of usability we want to decrease the work workload unless we want to challenge players with this so that's why it's important to define where we want to challenge players um so that's the usability now engageability is, is my term <laughs> some people use that term um it's throughout all my career um i've changed terms at uh, some point i was talking about game flow or immersion or fun or fun ability um i moved away from these terms either because they were not precise enough or because they were very subjective like fun like, as soon as you talk about fun and people are like oh i found that fun one that but that's not fun and then you have in a debate like you're in opinion land and and then you can't really move forward so now i use the term engageability because it does a nice balancing with uh, usability. It's the ability of the game to be engaging in that in this time. And for games, so for some products, it, it is also interesting, like for health products, um, health devices, like your Fitbit, or um, for anything educational, you want people to be engaged with it. Um, and so for gamification, uh, it's an oh. interesting uh, concept as well. But for games, it's really essential. If your game is not engaging, why do you even play that game um and so engaging is a better term because we care about our, our players coming to play your game and are they staying and this is what we measure and for to play games for example we measure retention and retention is a measure for engagement um so within that term and again this is not coming from academia it's coming from my background and so it's coming from research but the way i wrap it up it's more my way when i chat with a game developers. And so engageability is it's mostly about motivation. Are people motivated to play your game and to come back? Uh, it's about emotion. Is your is your game creating the emotions that you want? So uh, offline, we're talking about um, game feel, for example. Is it juicy? So things like that. You know, do you feel you feel part of the world you feel like your actions in the game is really impacting the world um so do you have like the, that that sort of feeling uh so that's all the emotion about it and also it's about discovery or surprises in the game and then you have game flow so do you feel that at some point you're really in the flow and the zone we we'll also use that term um so all these three elements to me are really core to engageability but the most important one is motivation because there is no behavior if there is no motivation. You would not be listening to me right now if you were not motivated to listen to me. Maybe someone forcing is forcing you <laughs> to listen to me, and I feel bad for you if it's the case. But it's still a form of motivation. So uh, otherwise, you're not even here. So we need to understand how motivation works human motivation and we have some good theories. We don't understand everything. There are so many things that are mysterious about the human brain and, and human behavior. Um, but we have some good theories that we can use, um, like um, extrinsic motivation and intrinsic motivation. Why do we do the things we do in certain cases that we can use to, again, to help um, us develop a game so that we have we have ingredients. Again, we don't have a recipe for a successful game, but we have ingredients. And depending on the game you're making, and if you look at all these guidelines, uh, this framework for game UX around usability and engageability, then you can find the solutions. So you can identify your problems earlier and then find the solutions to your problems more efficiently. Uh <laughs> I'm going to have to ask you, Celia. Please do not give away the you know secrets to all of our viewers. <laughs> you know by admitting that we've got them pinned up and tied to their chairs at, at any you know, given moment. Um, well, there's, uh, that's the that's the thing. There's no secret to reveal. Like there again, these are just ingredients. So once you know the ingredients, you, you know where to start. But you still gonna have to and the, iterate. And the zip ties, yes, those are all the ingredients that we yep. use for a good audience. That's that's yep. perfect. All right, so <laughs> we've got our first questions coming in from the audience. <laughs> And I, I started laughing when I read this one because, oh, my God, what is your opinion on the old school tutorial type of the 20 page long pamphlet bought with the game and maybe as a new example to try and implement that approach into modern times? Yeah, well, it's, it's the it's the main difference between board games and video games. Uh, in board games, you also have, you know, all the pages about how to play the game and you can feel it when you start a new game that you've never played before it's a board game and like it's overwhelming oh, yes. when the game is a bit complex uh and typically what we do is we look like very quickly at the rules and how we start and then we're like okay we're gonna do 
like just around we're gonna play around to see how how it, how it plays because we learn oftentimes we learn better by doing and video games can do that very well if again <laughs> if you think about it early on and you think about how you're gonna onboard players but we have the capacity to teach players as they play and step by step without overwhelming everybody with that uh, so we know in terms of, of learning process uh, learning principles uh, there there are three main learning principles that we can use in games uh, the first one is behaviorism so it's conditioning like for example you see a, a stimulus like you see a character like shooting an arrow or something like that and you understand that oh my god i, I need to <laughs> i need to dive i need to uh, avoid this because otherwise i'm gonna die or get hurt uh, so there's a lot of things we by using by polishing the signs and feedback in the game uh that's usability that's really basic usability can on, can people understand what is dangerous to them how to solve problems um so if you look at a game like the uh, brawl stars they they polish a lot their their signs and feedback you understand where there's collision where you can hide uh what type of guns um do you have it's it's very clear and it, but it's clear not because they're geniuses it's clear because they did a lot of work and iterated and tested the game and and, and tried to see you know what was um, understandable what was not so that's conditioning behaviorism like just understanding by um, st stimulus and response you know what what is efficient and what you can do in the game then you uh, you can use cognitive um, psychology principles is the understanding that the brain is limited uh, it's your brain that's trying to understand how to play the game but the brain is marvelous but we also have great limitations in terms of mental processes perception is subjective attentional resources are scarce we can't multitask and um, memory is fallible we can't memorize everything so knowing this we're going to adjust the environment of the game so that we are not going to overwhelm players so for example for perception we're going to test things that players see to verify that what they perceive from the game is what we intended to uh, communicate. Uh, we're gonna make sure that there's not too many things happening at the same time, especially when the player has to learn something new because otherwise the brain can't multitask and there's a very good chance that players are not gonna be able to process that information. And then we try to not overwhelm players by things they need to remember. That's why the HUD is very important or uh, stuff like, like I said, you know, you can pin the recipe of what you want to craft in Fortnite. That's alleviating the memory load for our players. So that's the second principle that we use. And then the third principle is what we call constructive, constructive, oh, it's hard to say, <laughs> constructionism principle is the idea that if you build your knowledge, you uh, most of the time you learn it better. And so basically it's the idea that learning by doing is more efficient. So instead of saying, hey, player, you know, if you build stairs, you're going to be able to get out of uh, holes and, and stuff like in Fortnite. Instead of doing that, what we do is we place the player in a hole. <laughs> there we, we The level design is all about we place the player in a situation when there's a problem, an obstacle, an obstacle to overcome. And then learning about building stairs to get out is the solution to that obstacle. So we think about how we can place the player in a situation whereby they understand why this is important, and then we teach them how to overcome that. So, that show you what we do because we're old is we only play Fortnite now in no build <laughs> mode. So all you know, my twelve year old's friends can't you know completely crank out nineties and beat the rest of us when we're like, no, we're just going to do it without stairs. That's the that's the easy way. <laughs> um, so th the next one on on the UX side from Krimi Sun on YouTube. How do you tell if your game needs a client main, a windowed client main menu, or a full screen main menu? You know, with the except with example of League of Legends versus Overwatch. Yeah. Uh, so again, it really depends on what your game is about. Is it a strategy game, uh, or is it more action driven? So typically, <laughs> um, a MOBA is going to be more strategy driven and Overwatch is going to be more action driven. And that's going to dictate what you need to do and how you're going to express all these things. Uh, it's also, we uh, I, I get a lot of questions about diegetic UI. So I don't know if you know what that is. Uh, diegetic UI is, for example, Dead Space. So instead of having your health bar on the HUD, you have it directly 
on the 3D model of your character. And so it's embedded inside the world. And so we call that diegetic UI. Uh, diegetic UI is more um, elegant, let's say that. People say more immersive. Let's say you feel more of a, a presence in the game where when the elements are part of the game. So that's great if you can do it. The problem with that is it's not easy to do it well and to communicate correctly that to players. Uh, it's harder if you have, so if you have only one character, it's fine, like Dead Space, just one character, easy. Well, easy. Uh, easier. <laughs> but if you have a game like a MOBA with a lot of different heroes, then it's starting to be complicated to have good consistency across all the different characters that have different skills um, to really communicate, you know, their abilities and their health if they are in, if their 3D model are different. And so that's going to dictate the kind of solutions that you're going to uh, bring. So same thing with your question. It's really going to depend on what sort of information, like how much information does the player need at the same time? Um, is it more action-driven, strategy-driven? Um, that's going to drive the solutions that we're going to craft. Players. All right. So that is like the third new word I have learned today. And at this point, I'm either <laughs> going to assume you really know what you're doing, or you're just like literally making this up as you go along. Um, either one is fine, truthfully, but I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> My vocabulary. It's all in my book. You'll it's see it. lots Two of books. terms. You can learn a lot of things in there. <laughs> That's what I said. Join us today because Celia has literally written the book on this. Two of them. <laughs> um, so, what do you do? You know, you said that you've got to start UX early, and I completely and one hundred percent agree with that. Mm -hmm. What are the things that you need to be doing in the studio to build a good UX strategy yeah. from the get go? Yeah, so it starts with defining the experience you want to offer to your players. So this is already what we talked about, you know, defining your game pillars, what's the game, a main gameplay loop, um, what is really the thing that you want to convey in your game that's going to make it different from the other games. Um, so that's the experience, defining the X in UX, defining the experience. Uh, where do you want to change players and where do you want? you don't want to change players um, because all throughout the development of your game, you're going to have to make uh, um, decisions and you're going to have to make choices sometimes and you're not going to be able to implement all the features and you're going to have to make difficult choices. And so if you have a strong, if you define very clearly and the whole team is in agreement about what experience we want to offer uh, and where do we don't want to challenge players, it's going to be much easier for you to make those decisions uh, later on. So that starts there, defining the X. Then you define the U. Who are your users? Who are your players? You're not going to make the same decisions if you are making a game for hardcore players that are really like really like to suffer and just they love Souls games. Uh, or if you want to make a game that is more uh, for a broad audience, that's more um, um, mainstream and and uh, you want to make it um, have a lot of people and make it easy for, for them to join and have fun. Uh, and also depends on your business model. Is it a uh, mobile game? Is it a free-to-play game? You know, a multiplayer game? All this, these things are going to have an impact on your decision. So you start there. Uh, and then once you're there and you went through conception and you are in the um, pre-production mode, so you're testing a bunch of things, you're prototyping, this is where you're going to have to uh, think about your prototypes are, as a way to build hypotheses and verify your hypothesis. So that's also very strong in terms of UX. We're gonna try a bunch of things. And if if you have the, a good mindset for that, um, you're gonna be able to, to test those things um, with a stronger vision. And also you're gonna test them um, in a more scientific way. Uh, that's going to help you figure out stuff. Like, for example, and we're working on 1313. We're defining what would be the good um, 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 settings for uh, the sensitivity of the th thumbstick when you aim, um, because it was on console. Um, and so we built up a um, gym level where players or people just had to shoot at stuff at, at targets and there were different distance and angles and we were had a lot of people testing that that allowed us to find the perfect or well, the perfect the um the the better setting for most people 
for the, the thumbstick sensitivity by default. So we do that. And so you think about all the gym levels and all the things you need to test during your prototyping uh, time by thinking about what problems you need to solve for the players. Um, so that's during the pre-production uh, phase. And when you're in production, this is where you have to find a solution to your problems. And so again, having a UX mindset will allow you to uh, regularly do play test sessions with real players, not just people on your team who are, who are very biased because they, they know the game too well or your friends and family that also don't want to hurt your feelings. Um, and so we, we want to have regular sessions where we verify a bunch of things, but also where we pause hypotheses. A lot of people just do tests just to see things and well do a test uh to just uh, yeah okay what do you want to test i don't know you know <laughs> just test the game um it doesn't work that way you have to define your hypotheses uh you have to define for example you add a feature does that feature um accomplish the goal for the players so that's an hypothesis you're gonna test once your feature is ready to go uh it's also very important to know what is ready for testing and what is not Another myth, another thing uh, uh, that I see a lot of people doing is like thinking that nothing, it's not ready for testing. A feature is ready for testing when it's functional. It doesn't need to be beautiful. It doesn't need to be all there. It needs to be functional. Um, so as long as it's functional and it has like placeholder uh, UI that is understandable. So don't make things that I, only you can understand. <laughs> so, <laughs> as, as long as you have things that can convey information, then you can test it. Uh, there's always something you can test. We do paper prototypes. We test a bunch of things very early on. Um, so think about what is ready for testing, but also be in the mindset that all the stuff that is placeholder, try to make it functional early on so that you can test you know if if it works or not for players and then later on, i'm gonna art it up and test it again once it's ordered up um so it's thinking about all that and when you're closer to your alpha this is when you're gonna do more um uh testing and longer and you're gonna test more things and, and when everything comes together this is when you do different tests so early on you, you do um um, isolated tests or they're, they're shorter and you just start to define a, a bunch of things. You test, you know, you do task analysis. You ask players, all right, I'll try to find a weapon and craft it. This sort of things that we do early on. And then later on, it's just like bringing players like, all right, play the game and see, you know, do you understand things? And do you care about what you're doing? And wh what do you care about? What do you want to uh, gain in two hours uh, from now and so then we can see our players motivated to keep playing and what do they care about so we do that and then we enter like beta beta and this is when we do more testing <laughs> and this is where we have um telemetry data and, and i keep unplugging my computer <laughs> <laughs> um and 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 so all throughout the development of the game depending on the stages there's always something that we do and the more we move forward and more all the things come together, um, the, the different tests that we do. But also once you're close to beta and close to um, um, do like a, a soft launch or something like that, this is not when you want to solve problems about your pillars. Uh, the problems about the pillars, you need to solve that in pre-production or and very early on in production. Towards the end, this is when you want to fine tune the game and, and fine tune the onboarding. Uh, but even in pre-production, you can test the situations that is going to be good to teach players about your game. So like, for example, in the Fortnite, we found the situation about teaching about building when the player is in a hole and needs to get out. Um, that was tested very early on with different iterations of that. How, how do we, uh, how do we uh, um, teach players about building in the most efficient and fun way possible? We iterated a bunch uh, very early on in pre-production or early production. And then at some point, we're like, oh, yeah, we're just going to have the player in a hole. Uh, then we knew that, OK, at some point in the onboarding, we know that the player needs to get out of the hole somehow in the story. Um, that we solved later on. But and at least very early on, we knew how we would teach that. Um, and so towards the end of development, this is when we put the story together. But the story, by that time, we already know how the story is going to support the onboarding plan and the onboarding process for the game. So, all of these things. 
<laughs> all, all together now. So yeah. we've we've uh, reached the part where my job gets really, really easy now because we've got a ton of really good questions coming in. So James from YouTube says, how do you delineate and draw the line between UX and game design? For example, between a UX designer and a game designer, who mm -hmm. does what and how do you figure that out? Yeah, so game design is part of the experience for players. Uh, so again, everybody on the team is should be concerned about the UX for players. Uh, but it's a great question. So between game designers and UX designers, it's also going to depend on the size of the of your team. You have like smaller teams that sometimes the game designer is also going to be the UX designer. But in bigger teams like on Fortnite or like in, in bigger studios, the game designer is the person who's going to define the rules of the game or the system. You have system designers. So, for example, they're going to say, well, we have crafting in this game and the crafting is going to be at the minimum. You have two ingredients, maximum five ingredients. Um, you have like three main ingredients and may some like three like. Uh, you can have bricks and metal. So this, all these things are defined usually by the game designer. They define the rules of the game, the the um, uh, what are the different elements, and what is the minimum, the maximum, and what's everything in between. And then the UX designer is, is knowing all that is like, all right, how do we convey that properly to players so that they can actually do those things? Um, and so sometimes the UX designer can challenge the game designer. It's like. Well, we have too many ingredients from too many systems. Like it's really making it super hard to convey that in a usable way for players. Are you sure that we need all this complexity? So sometimes the game designers say, yes, we need that because in, I don't know, in 40 hours of, of a gameplay, uh, if we don't have that, then everything collapses. And sometimes they're like, hmm, yeah, maybe it's not really bringing enough depth and it's costing a lot of complexity for players. Like for example, in Fortnite, initially they had a different uh, harvesting tool depending on what sort of uh, uh, material you're harvesting. So for example, the pickaxe would only be for uh, for harvesting rocks, and then you would have an ax to harvest um, wood. And then they realized like, you know what? It's, it's not bring a lot of depth uh, but or or the cost of it of that added depth is too much complexity for players, and it's not really serving the gameplay. So sometimes game designers, because they see that hmm, it's it's really costing a lot in terms of of UX design, they roll back and they're like, you know what, we're gonna define just one harvesting tool for everything, and that makes it simpler uh, to convey for players. So there's always a lot of um, of a tension between depth of the the design and complexity. You want depth, you don't want complexity to the point that you know the it's really hard for the UX designer to really convey that to players. So, from what I see, the in my, in my experience for, for big studios, the game designer is about is more about the why. Why do we need this? Why do we care? What? Why is it important for players? And the UX designer is more about the how. How are we going to convey that? And what do we need to display for players? So another one from YouTube. Do you have any tips on how to improve the UX culture in the studio? <sighs> yes, I do have tips, but I'm not going to lie. It's it's hard and it takes a lot of time. Um, so in there, there's a bunch of books uh, that you can use. Um, so in game usability, it's, it's not the cheaper. That's why you know, it's complicated. But um, I wrote a chapter talking about um, how you can push for better UX maturity. And the epitome of UX maturity is having a UX culture at your studio. I currently do not know any game studio that have a strong UX culture. Some of them are really getting close to them, uh, to that, you know, uh, Microsoft, you know, they started very early on. Uh, they put in place a lot of processes. They, they It's pretty strong. Um, but you still don't have a UX culture um, just because it's hard. Um, so there's different steps. Uh, so it depends on where you're at. I, I use the Kekendo maturity model. So it's K-E-I-K-E-N-D-O. Uh, you can find that on 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 the web is fairly easy and you see different steps so um you first have to determine what is the ux maturity at the studio and then you will see uh, what are the main um 
uh, barriers and what do you need to do to overcome those barriers. So, for example, if direction about UX is people are like, well, what, is, what, what the hell is that? We don't need that. We don't need, you know, psychology, what uh, all this shit, you know, to make games. Um, that means that you're really like first level <laughs> UX maturity. You have like people rejecting it and not really understanding that. So what you need to do is to advocate, to explain, well, no, we're not here to tell you your job. Like you're, you know, you know your job very well. We're just here to bring you tools and to make it more efficient, faster, um, and we're gonna help you accomplish your goals uh, more efficiently. Um, because the brain is limited, and it's just by understanding those things and having a strong methodology, you're just gonna have more tools in your tool set um, to to accomplish these things. Um, and if if it's just like people understand that, but they say, well, yeah, UX is great, but we don't have any more enough money for that this is when you have to advocate for well okay but if you don't do it look at all the money you're gonna uh spend and to, uh, toward the you know down the line because you're gonna have a bunch of problems gonna be accumulating and and then you can launch the game and it's, it's gonna fail and 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 then it's gonna be a catastrophe <laughs> um so look look up this model is uh, i like it because it's easy to convey and it had a nice, a nice uh, uh, image of it. It's also in my book, The Gamer's Brain. It's probably, you're probably going to find articles online because I, I wrote some articles about it. So you might find it online as well. Um, and look at where you're at and what are the, the next steps to move forward. And they keep coming in. So from Sergio, what are the connections and differences between UX design and user research? Um, yeah, so UX, UX is the mindset. UX design is, again, how we convey things to uh, people. So it's really thinking about interaction design, information architecture. Um, it's not just UI. <laughs> uh, interaction design is like really how, you know, what do people do? Like double click, tap, hold, all of that is part of interaction. So there's a lot around the controls, uh, but also what information you present when, what is the order and, and what is the uh, uh, architecture and, and the priority. So that's the UX designers. And now the UX researchers, what they do is they measure the actual experience that people have currently with your game. And is it matching the experience that you want for them? <laughs> so they measure uh, the experience, they measure the usability and the engageability of your game development. And they find where the problems are. And they they also try to help with suggesting, you know, how we can solve for these problems. It, it's complicated. Uh, it's, not, it's not easy to find out, but they're the ones who are measuring the, the experience of players and trying to um, solve the problems uh, so that uh, the game can, can work well. And so sometimes... I mean, UX designers should work very closely with uh, user researchers, and sometimes they do their own research. Uh, again, if, if you are a smaller team, uh, UX designers oftentimes do their own research. The caveat with that is that uh, research is difficult, and you have to understand very deeply uh, the limitations of the brain and our biases. So sometimes if you do a research and you don't account for those biases, you can find wrong outcomes. So that's the problem when you do your own research. It's better if you can have like a, a researcher that, that has been um, um, trained to conduct research. Um, but, you know, it, it depends on your size of, of your team. So the next one is actually coming from the Discord. Are there any special considerations for designing educational games or games with a strong yeah. message that you want to convey? Yes, for educational games, what you care about, if you truly want to be educational, uh, you care about transfer. So transfer is a concept in education. Um, let's say you you play a game and you learn something about the game. Do you are you able to transfer what you've learned from that game onto other uh, context? So, for example, like typically, it's very hard to establish transfer. Uh, but for example, if you play um, that games like a, a lot about learning or they make you do mental calculation. And so you do that. And at some point you get better at mental calculation within this game, but it's not really making you smarter or um, making you uh, apply more math concepts uh, onto different situations. Um, but you have educational games that 
we will receive better transfer. And it's typically those when you learn by doing. So constructionism, constructionism <laughs> that was talking about earlier, uh, we see better transfer overall than root learning or conditioning. Um, and so it's, for example, uh, Lego Dacta. I don't know if you remember um, like the, the part of Legos when you build machines. And, and, and so children, because they care about machines and building robots, uh, they're going to learn about the rules of physics. And so it's not it's not the machine that tell them rules of physics in a rote learning way. It's they care about building something, and to build it, they have to learn about the rules of physics. And and typically, when you do that, learning by doing in a meaningful way, we oftentimes see better transfer. So that's why educational games are so hard to do, and most of them are so called educational, but they're not really because you don't really have that transfer um, of learning. All right. So do you think that some departments like audio design or level design have matured more in that department, in the department of giving the player information, or is it a more static development industry-wide? No. So the I I love working with uh, um, uh, sound designers and musicians because they understand these things very well. And they actually, they understand a lot about perception being subjective. Uh, so I oftentimes when I do my training sessions, uh, for example, I'm going to talk about uh, shepherd tones. <laughs> and so our sound designers know what this is. A shepherd tone is when he feels that they have a sound that growing and going up uh, forever. In reality, it's not possible. Uh, that's because we don't really perceive the reality as it is. Uh, perception is a construct of the mind. And so sound designers understand that very well. Um, so they're very sharp. The problem then they're not listened to. <laughs> and their um, old sound design is oftentimes it's an afterthought. Or you're going to have the, same, the game designer say, hey, oh, by the way, we need a beep for that. Uh, and so that's the reason why you have to, on, to think about all the signs and feedback for all your features very early on. Like for example, you're going to build a flamethrower and the flamethrower is going to be a, like a mini system that is supposed to make the player feel very powerful and maybe destroy a bunch of zombies very quickly. Um, and so you're going to have different uh, uh, states of that system. You can have, for example, the normal flame. Maybe you can have a super flame. Um, the flame flamethrower can also overheat and you can be out of gas. Those are all the different so for example, as your game designer, these are all the different states of your system. If you explain very quickly, like in one pager, these are all the different states of the system, then all your artists, including the sound designers, are ready for the beeps and stiff and all the stuff uh, to convey those different states of that system uh, to the players. And so the problem is that sound designers are very sharp with that, um, but they are not in the loop early enough. So love your sound designers. They need them. <laughs> love them and appreciate them. Exactly. Or, or they'll substitute <laughs> sounds you may not want. Um, all right. So we've got time for two more questions. Next one is from Jacob on LinkedIn. For indie developers, we are usually small and have budget constraints. Do you have yep. any recommendations or tips on efficient ways to collect and analyze feedback? What yep. patterns do you like to utilize? Yeah, so um, I, I give a lot of tips in my book. It's really thought also for people who don't necessarily have a lot of uh, uh, budget. Um, but really, again, think about you would not ship your game without having QA uh, help in there. Uh, it's part where you have to put some budget in there. Uh, so same thing for UX. So think about that. Um, you can bring people in like friends and family. It's, it is more biased than having a broad population. But if you don't have any other means, you can do that. But I would recommend you to ask very uh, objective questions. Don't ask people, did you have fun? Uh, did you find the interface usable or intuitive? Ask them, what is this? Um, take a screenshot and ask them, who do you think is winning in the game at that moment? Ask very objective questions. Because then you can find out, is it intuitive enough? So that would be my overall uh, recommendation. But again, I, I give a bunch of tips uh, all throughout the, the, all the, my, my books to help you 
ask the right questions depending on what you're measuring. Uh, for usability, it's much easier um, because you want something to convey something precise, precisely. So you ask them, you know, what is this? What is that? What do you think you can go? What do you think is the objective here? Uh, but then for engagement, uh, it's, it's more difficult to uh, find the right questions, but it's it's going to be around motivation. So extrinsic motivation, for example, do you know how to get this weapon or what weapon do you care of, of getting? You know, what are your main objectives right now? So you ask them again, ask precise questions to try to find out what they're trying to do, because if they answer, well, I don't really know. I'm just playing to see what's going to happen. It means that your game is not engaging. Your players should have objectives. They should care about unlocking the ninja class or getting that weapon because it looks freaking awesome. Uh, but they also should be uh, able to feel competent, autonomous, and have relatedness. That's intrinsic motivation. We didn't really have time to talk about this, but that's also very important. So do they feel competent? Do they feel they're progressing in the game? Because that's really, really important if your players don't understand how to progress in the game. It's a red flag you need to solve for this. So you can ask questions like, uh, do you know what to do to get better in the game? Or do you understand why you died? Um, so again, <laughs> like, you, you use all this, the ingredients that I talked about to try to ask precise <laughs> questions to your friends and family. So that is going to be less biased. I hope it helps a little bit. <laughs> no, I don't know why I died. If I had known why I died, I wouldn't have died. Oh, <laughs> come on. Okay, you die. Sometimes if you play Souls games, they're very clear. You die multiple times, but you really clearly know why. <laughs> so that's the big difference between like understanding why you died and dying. And you're like, what the, you know, happened? <laughs> like, and then you're frustrated and like, and you feel the game is, is unfair. You don't want players to feel that the game is unfair. But that's the beauty of the kill cam. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So well, you know where that came from. It's, yeah, if it's done well. It's <laughs> yeah, that's true. And, it and, and fast, somebody's so. not running a bot and like watching you through a wall or something. Um, yeah. All right. So, last one for today. And Celia is on our Discord server. So, if you've got questions that we didn't get to, pop them there. And, and she's got the wonderful yellow guest of the show tag now. So, Last one, Jack from YouTube. First of all, this discussion is very interesting. I think so too. I'm learning <laughs> a lot myself. Um, my question is, how do you deal with burnout and the passion to keep creating? Oh boy. Okay. Uh, that's a great question. Uh, but you know what? All the things that we uh, suggest to make a game more engaging for players are absolutely applicable for game developers to still be engaged into making games. Uh, so feeling competent is <laughs> one thing. Um, being able to rest is very important. There's we are we have a culture of crunch, and not only this is not good for creativity. There's a bunch of research showing that you know crunching or being tired, if it's lasting too long, so more like a week or so, it's really not good for your creativity. It's also making you feel overwhelmed and and you're not going to have that same motivation to keep making games autonomy is another one um if so you have to have a vision for your team of course because we all need to go in the same direction but it's important for the team members to feel an ownership and how to solve problems so you define a direction say okay we need to accomplish this by this next sprint for example but then individuals need to feel the autonomy uh, to how they're going to solve these problems and relatedness it's team building is much more satisfying um than being in competition you have a lot of models in our society when people make competition between different teams and they think that this is actually going to motivate people that it's not as efficient as cooperation actually you have a much stronger drive when you try to accomplish together um this a, a goal and and win together rather than entering in competition um so <laughs> i would recommend to look into these things also for team building and um, make people satisfied but it's it's a harsh industry and yeah you can feel tired at some points um so we need when you have you know in big um companies they do that sometimes they put people like they okay you're gonna stop thinking and you're banging your head on the, onto this problem go out like do something else because this is how we can unlock our brain because we freeze if we just try to solve something and we try to 
really like get through that wall, it's really not the best way to do it for our brain. That brain needs to go out, uh, just go for a walk or have fun or do something else because this is when we can actually solve problems. Just like when you try to go through a bus and you do it again and again and again and you're tired and you're like, fuck that shit. <laughs> you throw your, your uh, controller across the room. The best thing you need to do if you've been playing for a while is just stop, do something else, rest. And next thing in the morning, you play again and, and you pass the boss in the first time. And you're like, oh, my God, it was actually not that hard. Well, that's because your brain is rested. So same thing uh, for game development. We need to rest. It's actually more efficient <laughs> that way. But uh, I can I can sympathize. And yes, that is absolutely. You just have to get out and get away from it every now and then. Because yep. I mean, I, and I've said this many times. I've tried to get out of this industry three times in the last twenty five years. But then I go and do a job interview, or I go and touch somebody, and I'm like, "There's no way in hell I'm going to do that." I'm just like <laughs> I'm just going to go back to what I love. So, so I know you've got multiple books. You, you're going to be a GDC. This is your chance to yep. plug all of your stuff. What? Where can people learn more? Find you? celiahoden.com i try to make it usable for everyone and you'll find everything there so there's a resources page you'll find all my books there but also a bunch of resources about other books talking about all the things we talked about like game feel uh, or motivation so you'll find a bunch of stuff there and user research uh, all so, yeah. of these words that i'm pretty sure celia made <laughs> up through the course of this talk uh, i'm gonna <laughs> I just I just dropped the site. In, in it's my that. secret sauce, you know. I make things like, oh shit, like she seems yeah, to know she what, so what she's talking it's about. Like, <laughs> this is how you know I trick you <laughs> to buy my hey, books. It works. You, know? you know, that's 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 the beauty of it. But thank you so much. This has been a wonderful, a, a wonderful chat. Uh, thank you. And Dan, yes, sir. Do your do your do. Well, you know what's happening. In uh, March eighth and March 9th is the next, the twelfth indie game business conference. Sign up. Indiegame.business. Isn't it the 12th? I think it's like the 13th or 14th. <laughs> it's, it's a, I honestly it's, stopped counting. After it's in the 10s. Like it's in the 10s, right? So sign yeah. up, right? And Jay always says, hey, if you can't afford to do it, then what do you do, Jay? Send me an email. DM me. Message me. Find me. I'll give you a pass. All the, it's, the, the watching and participating in all the panels and the AMAs and all that sort of stuff is always free and it's always on YouTube. There's no vault we hide in. If you have, if you need a, me a meeting pass to pitch your game or to find a marketing firm or something like that, those are the ones that cost 50 bucks. And if you don't have 50 bucks, that's perfectly fine. You're why we do this. Just message me and I'll get you a pass. Amazing. Yes. And we just want a huge, a huge thank you right here. Tripwire presents yes. for sponsoring us continually and sponsoring the event. Uh, make sure. And if you need more information, just, you can just Google indie game business, March 8th and 9th, 2023. That's right. Lee, just Google indie game business, go to indie game dot business, discord dot GG slash indie game business. We're on Twitter, on Facebook, LinkedIn, all of that good stuff. Thank you so much, Celia, for coming and joining us. This was a, Thanks a for ton of amazing information and brought up some other stuff for some forward podcasts. And we have a baby screaming in the background. I don't know nice. if you can hear that, but yes. yes, just screaming. Yes, so thank you so much. because you moved that baby to Florida and it doesn't want to be there. That's well, they why. moved to Oklahoma, but then they came back, so yeah. She's screaming happiness. She's just happy. Ah! Yeah. So. All right. <laughs> Thank we'll, you. We'll see you all next week. Bye. Thanks, Celia. Cheers.